Thank you, and welcome to Process Injection, breaking all macOS security layers with a single vulnerability. If you are a macOS developer um, and you use Xcode, you may have noticed that if you create a new project with the latest Xcode version, there's a new method in the template for applications uh, for your application delegate. Application supports secure restorable state. Now, in this talk, I'm going to describe the vulnerability that necessitated this change and how we could exploit this um, for sandbox escape, privilege escalation, and then finally bypassing SIP. First, a bit about me. I'm Thijs Alkemade. I'm a security researcher at CompiTest. CompiTest is a security company in the Netherlands providing services like pen testing, incident response, and a security operations center. But together with my colleague Dan Kuiper, we are the research department, which means that we don't work for customers, but instead we look for vulnerabilities in systems that are used often or suddenly more popular um, to make the world a little bit safer. So all the work that you may have seen from us is a, a zero-click remote code execution vulnerability we showed at Pwn2Own to Own last year and winning Pwn2Own to Own Miami this year with five uh, ICS vulnerabilities. And there's some write-ups for these on our website if you want to know more about them. What I'm going to be talking about today is uh, Mac risk security, which is a bit of a specialty for me. Um, I've been a Mac user all my life, so it's, it's the system I know most. So um, uh, that's also where this vulnerability originated. And a, this presentation will be consists of two, three parts. First, I'll describe a little bit the Mac OS security model, because many, many people don't really understand um, the current security model. And then the second part will be introducing the vulnerability that I found. And then the third part will be to demonstrate how that vulnerability could be applied in three different ways to, uh, yeah, as I said, escape the sandbox, elevate privileges, and then finally bypassing SIP. So the macOS security model, as of the current latest release, meant macOS Monterey. Uh, to describe that, I'll first talk a little bit about the unix -y Linux security model as it used to be on macOS as well. Um, and the basic idea behind it is that users are the security boundaries, but processes are not. So you can see this for files. Any file has an owner as a group, and there are these nine flags to determine whether the owner or group or everybody is allowed to read, write, or execute. And also, if you want to attach a debugger to another process, um, then those processes need to be, in general, they need to be running as the same user. And root user is an exception to this. The root user can read or modify all files, and it can access basically any data in memory or even in the kernel and other processes. Uh, any data is available for the root user. Uh, this was the security model for macOS, but it no longer is, is the case. Ever since the introduction of system integrity protection, uh, this was introduced in 2015 with the El Capitan release, and this was from the WWDC uh, presentation where they announced it. And the basic idea of SIP originally was uh, to do two things. First of all, introduce a security layer between the root user and the kernel. And secondly, to protect the system from being modified uh, even by the root user. So having just root access is no longer enough to completely compromise the system. And the reason Apple wanted to do this is that getting root access on a Mac is pretty simple in general, if you're a malware, because most of the users are an admin user. So if you just prompt the user for their password to do something, update the system or something like that, and it's very easy to get the user to enter their password, and then you have root privileges. So that's why Apple introduced SIP. Um, one of the other names it's known as is rootless. Uh, many people thought, well, Apple's going to take the root user away from people like they do on the iPhone, but that's not really what this, need, what this name means. It means that the root is less powerful. That's uh, the idea behind it. So the way that works is that you now need an entitlement to perform dangerous operations. So an entitlement is some metadata that's included when a code signature is generated for an application. 
So for many dangerous operations that would compromise the system or the kernel, you now need a specific entitlement to do that. So loading a kernel extension or modifying the operating system or debugging a system process. So Apple can still make certain executables able to update the system because yeah, you still need to install updates, but it's no longer just possible for any root, for the root user to modify those files. And over the years, in the releases since, Apple has extended the protections of SIP to other parts of the system as well. So even debugging any application is now restricted, and you cannot just attach a debugger to anything um, unless they specifically allow that. And also an interesting feature is data faults um, with restricted file access. I have an example here. So Apple considers your email database to be very sensitive because it contains a lot of yeah, personal information. Also your messages database or your Safari history is protected in the same way. Um, and what this means is that you cannot just uh, see what files are there. Even the root user cannot do that. Uh, so even if the malware is on your Mac and has root user privileges, it cannot just read your email. But of course, mail itself needs to be able to access those files, otherwise it would be useless. So mail has a specific entitlement that allows it to access those files. And this is the uh, com.apple.rootless.storage.mail, which means it can access just the mail data vault, but nothing else. So in this way, now suddenly processes have become security boundaries. And that also means that there's new types of vulnerabilities that we need to think about. And one important one is process injection, which is basically the ability for one process to execute code as another process. So the th system thinks it's process B, but the code was actually specified by process A. And on Windows, um, you have these techniques like DLL hijacking that do similar stuff. Um, but on macOS, yeah, this can now really be a, a severe security issue if you are able to add code to a different process. And when Apple introduced SIP, as you can see on the right of the slide, many techniques that could lead to process injection were uh, disabled for those uh, protected programs. Um, so Apple thought a lot about how they can make this security boundary actually work. And also for third-party applications, Apple introduced what's known as the hardened runtime to prevent certain techniques that used to be possible uh, for injecting code like uh, dynamic linker environment variables, and also library validation, which basically prevents a similar technique like DLL hijacking, but for uh, macOS. But macOS is quite old, large, and established, so there's a lot of parts of the system that were written before the security model had changed. And yeah, it's not possible to really reconsider the entire system under this new security model. So there may still be vulnerabilities that can be used to inject code into other applications. Now, thir third party applications can often have those process injection vulnerabilities. Um, for example, to abuse what's known as TCC, basically the permission prompt you get if an application wants to use your webcam for the first time. Um, and many third party developers are not aware of this security model. So anytime you find a vulnerability like this, you have to completely explain the security model um, and that, yeah, it not, might be possible to use their application to steal the webcam data. You can also often do attacks like downgrading an application to an older version and then still use the, the permissions that the application has. But those are incidents, those are incidental vulnerabilities. Of course, it's much nicer to have a process injection vulnerability you can just apply everywhere. And that's exactly what I found. So the CVE 2021 3873 is a process injection vulnerability in AppKit, which basically means that any AppKit-based application was vulnerable. And where this vulnerability was in is in the safe state feature. So when you shut down your computer, um, there's this checkbox if you want to reopen the, the windows that you have open the next time you log in. And this is known as safe state or persistent UI uh, internally. And this also do, does stuff like if you have an unsaved document, you never, didn't save it yet, but you shut down your Mac and then you start it up again, then it can recover the content of that unsaved document. And 
this largely works automatically. So application developers do not need to opt in, but AppKit will automatically see, oh, there's this safe state. I'm going to restore it and reopen these windows. But third-party developers can extend it. For example, if they have their own document format, then they may have their own objects that they want to store in that saved state. And that state is stored in your library in the application state folder. And there are um, basically two files that are important here. First of all, windows.plist. This is basically a list of all of the windows that were open in the application. Um, and for each of them, there's an encryption key. And then there's the data.data file, which, as far as I can tell, this is a unique format, not used anywhere else. And it contains a list of records. And each of those records is, uh, corresponds to a window. And it contains a serialized object encrypted using that key from the windows.plist file. Now, I have no idea why this is encrypted, because the files are right next to each other. There's no permission differences between them. Uh, there's also no uh, integrity check on the ciphertext. So I have no idea why it's encrypted, but it, apparently it is. And the vulnerability that I found is that this object that's encrypted here is serialized using a non-secure uh, serializer, so non-secure coding. Now, serialization vulnerabilities are very common in C Sharp and Java, very well known. But also Python and Ruby, it's also very easy to exploit it to gain code execution. But Apple's serialization format hasn't really been discussed for these types of vulnerabilities, as far as I could find. Um, so Apple's format is called NS coding, but Apple added a secure version and a secure coding in 10.8, which is 10 years ago. And the secure coding already solved the issue that uh, many serialization vulnerabilities, um, yeah, that uh, causes many of these serialization vulnerabilities. So instead of creating an object first and then checking if it is the correct type, which is, which is what leads to these vulnerabilities, because by then the object already exists and may be doing something in its constructor or destructor, you create the object while checking its type. So the example of the difference, insecure version, you first create the object and then you check its type. This is dangerous because by the time you check its type, the object already exists and it may have done something. And in secure version, you decode the object, but only if it is of this class or this uh, couple of classes. And secure coding is very common within macOS. It's also very often used between different security layers. So an application may be communicating with some service that's privileged and then sending these serialized objects over. It's even used within iMessage. So if you send a message to another user, that is a secure serialized object. Um, so there's been a lot of uh, research in the secure serialization format. But the insecure version is not used very often in these kind of contexts. So Apple has been very good at making sure it's not used in a way that could lead to vulnerabilities. But in this case, uh, yeah, it was possible. So what is the attack that this allows? So what you can do is you can create a new sa saved state for an application with a malicious serialized object. You can write it to that directory um, for the other application. And then you can ask the system to launch the other application. And then when the application runs, it will automatically deserialize that object. And then, yeah, we could be executing code within, an ad, within another application, which also means that we have, uh, we can use the entitlements or permissions of that other application. So I found this, and then it was just, well, what object do I write? Can I find anything somebody else has done? So there's this famous project, uh, Why So Serial, for Java to use serialization vulnerabilities, and also Why So Serial.net for C Sharp. But yeah, no similar project exists for Objective C. I also checked a couple of Google Project Zero write ups where they exploited uh, serialization. But in all of those cases, it was secure serialization using a very specific vulnerability. And those were now fixed, so I could no longer apply those techniques. So I had to really find out, yeah, construct this object chain from scratch to exploit this issue. 
So how did I do that? So I decompiled or loaded into my decompiler app kit, and then I looked through all of the init with coder functions to look for something useful. And to my surprise, many of those classes that are deserializable uh, do not implement secure coding. But they are also often not that interesting, because the only thing they do is just recursively de decode their own instance variables, and then there's really no, no other functionality that you might be able to access. So the first step uh, that I found that I could use was the NS rule editor. Uh, I hope it's readable. Um, so what this does is it obtains an object from the archive, and then it obtains a key path from the archive, and then it creates a binding to that object using that key path. So bindings are something like a re uh, reactive programming technique in macOS. This means that you can sort of, yeah, you can directly con connect your view to a model without having to use a controller. Um, and, in, and one thing that uh, you need to specify is that key path, and that determines a property that you want to bind to. So, for example, if you have a person, you might bind to their name to make a field that automatically contains their name. But that key path can basically be any method. Um, even if it's not a property. So you can bind to any method as long as this has no arguments. So you can just bind to yeah, uh, any zero argument method on an object. So with this class, I could now call methods um, with the, without any arguments. And then the next step was NS custom image wrap. Uh, this obtains a object from the archive and then a selector. And the selector is basically like a function pointer for a Objective-C method. Um, but it doesn't use them yet, it just stores them. But then when you call draw on that um, object, it will call the selector on the object that it obtained. So if we combine this with the previous step, where we can call zero argument methods, we can now call the draw method on a NS custom image wrap to perform any method although we don't have any control yet over the arguments. It passes itself as its first argument, and any other arguments will be random data that happens to be in those registers. But this is a very powerful primitive already because you can call a lot of different functions. Now, I have to skip a few steps for time reasons and also disclosure reasons, um, but uh, I'll summarize the steps a little bit here. So we can first call those zero argument methods, and then we can call any method. And then we use a trick to create other objects that were not uh, implementing that NS coder, so they're usually not serializable. Then we use the same trick to call zero argument methods on those objects. And then another trick to call arbitrary methods on those objects. And that's basically enough to evaluate AppleScript within that process. And evaluating AppleScript is already very powerful, because if we, um, for example, would attack mail, then we can now access the files within the mail data vault, copy them out, or we could spawn a reverse shell uh, and do stuff like that. So this was a nice success to have already. Um, but in one of the instances of the exploit that we wanted to use, this was not enough. We really wanted to have basically equivalent to native code execution in that other process. But this was quite tricky, because as I mentioned, there's now the hardened runtime. And the hardened runtime is, is meant to make these kinds of attacks harder. <coughs> so it prevents us from creating memory pages that are uh, yeah, readable, writable and executable, so no uh, j just in time compilers are allowed. There's the library validation, so we cannot just load the DLL or the dynamic library. And also the environment variables, which would not be useful here, but also blocked. So how could we get around that? Um, and the solution I found was I could load the Python framework, which was signed by Apple. And at the time, it was still included in macOS. Uh, 
And then I could import the C-types module. And then using that, I could basically evaluate code that was equivalent to native code, just call C functions, create structs, stuff like that. But now I was only able to create Objective-C objects, but I wanted to call into Python, and the Python framework doesn't have any Objective-C interface that you can use. So I had to find some intermediate steps for this. And what I used for that is called the App AppleScript Objective-C bridge. It's basically similar to AppleScript, but it has the uh, Objective-C runtime bridged into AppleScript. <coughs> And what I noticed about that is that um, the hardened runtime doesn't allow you to load libraries that are not signed by Apple. But you, by using uh, AppleScript Objective-C, you can load scripts from another bundle. Those scripts don't need to be signed. So you can use this to load an Apple script uh, into another process. And this allowed me to create Objective-C objects call methods, call C functions, which was very useful because this was not possible before. But there was still one downside. I could not create any pointers to things that were not Objective-C objects. I could not create any structs or work with C strings because the runtime doesn't read the Apple script Objective-C bridge doesn't allow that. But I could call C functions. So I went through all of the uh, functions exported by the Python framework. But all of those really require, require the char pointer, because you need to pass either a path or the actual Python code that you want to evaluate. And I had no way of generating those character pointers using an AppleScript Objective-C. But then I found a very neat but ugly trick to do that. I could call pyMain with zero and null, and null is, because it's zero, it's equivalent to nil. Uh, this was allowed. And what this means is that the process now acts as if it is Python, as if you would launch it normally in a shell, which means that it starts this REPL within another process. So in, on standard input, I could just pass all of the Python code that would then be evaluated in that process. Now, if you're um, a fan of how verbose AppleScript or Objective-C is, then you really should look at the AppleScript Objective-C bridge because it's basically even for boost than both of those. And this is how you call functions. Um, yeah, you need to uh, wrap everything in around, tell current application, and then um, all of these uh, apostrophes to access uh, Objective-C uh, calls. And using this with a reference that basically passed nil into it, um, I could load the Python REPL. So to summarize that, um, I could evaluate AppleScript with the AppleScript Objective-C bridge, and I could evaluate Python, I could import C types, and now I could execute code that's basically equivalent to native code within the application. I can just create structs, I could create C, uh, char pointers, I could call C functions. And yeah, I've just bypassed the, the hardened runtime restrictions and can now execute any code in the process. And also the neat thing about C-types is that this just works even with all of those restrictions. If you look at, for example, the other frameworks included, um, like Ruby or Perl, um, and you can create bindings to C, but then you often need to uh, compile some intermediate code to uh, create those bindings, and then the uh, library validation would not allow that. So, now, for exploitation, for the three different ways that this vulnerability could be applied. First of all, escaping the sandbox. To do that, um, I need to explain how this works. So this is an open panel. It looks really boring. Um, you see it a lot if you use macOS. Um, but it's actually technically quite complicated. Because if you have a sandboxed application, then the application cannot list all of the files you have on disk. But if you want to open a file, it would be very inconvenient if the application can't know what files you have before you open something. So the way Apple implemented this is that the window is now part of the application, 
but the contents are being drawn by a different process. If you're a web developer, you may be familiar with iframes. This is kind of like the same idea. So there's this open and, panel, open and safe panel service, which draws the contents. And then when a the user selects a file and clicks open, that panel will give temporary access to that file back to the application. So then the application can read or write that file. And as it turned out, that open or safe panel was loading its saved state from the same files as the application itself. It's, I'm guessing that this is because you might want to resize the panel and then you might shut down your computer while that panel was open, so it needs to remember both states of the different uh, uh, com combination of this panel uh, with the application. But I'm not completely sure of that. So how we could attack this was quite simple. We just write the saved state into our own applications directory. We would trigger the open panel, and then we were executing code in a non-sandbox process. So essentially, we have already escaped the sandbox. And this part of the vulnerability was already fixed earlier than the rest. So this was fixed in 11.3. Uh, it was no longer sharing this directory with the open panel. So it was no longer possible to do the same thing. And the next step uh, was elevating privileges to root. And for this, I applied a trick found by somebody else. Um, so this was a, in uh, the in all of the logic books for the win write-up by Elias Morat. Um, there are, there's a specific entitlement, um, com.apple.private.authorization.services, which may contain something like system install Apple software. And what this entitlement means is that this application is allowed to install packages signed by Apple without any authorization or even any notification to the user. So they can silently install a new Apple signed package. And then this could be combined with a specific package, and the Mac OS public beta access utility. And when this package is installed, it has a post install script, so a script that runs after the installation, that tries to run a command from the disk you install it to. So normally you would install this to your Mac OS uh, disk, and then it would just run a command from there. But you can just install it to any disk currently connected to your Mac. So you can create a new RAM disk or disk image, write the script that you want to run to that disk, and then when you install this package to that disk, it would run that script, because there was no check that this was actually a Mac OS install disk. You can just install it to an empty disk image. And also mounting RAM disk or disk images does not require root privileges. So we could mount the disk, ask this uh, use the service to install this package, because it's signed by Apple, this is allowed. And then this post install script runs, which runs with root privileges, which means that we have now uh, elevated privileges to root. And then finally, uh, bypassing the SIP file system restrictions. Um, to do this, um, I basically wanted to make sure that we had the full impact of this vulnerability mapped out. So I looked to all of the applications that were available that were installed on macOS and that might have an entitlement that I could use. But I even looked through like the macOS Big Sur beta installation disk image. Um, and there I noticed this macOS update assistant application. And this has a very powerful entitlement, um, com.apple.rootless.install.heritable. And this basically means that it can access any SIP protected files um, and read or write to them. Uh, of course, the POSIX permission still applies, so you cannot just write to anything, but uh, we also elevated the privileges to root. And it's also heritable, which is a nice bon bonus because we can just spawn a reverse shell. We don't need to bother with Python within the process. Now, what we can do with this, um, for example, we can read the email or the messages database or the Safari history of all users. We can grant ourselves permission to use the webcam or the microphone of the user without the user have to, having to approve that. We can also persist very well in the system because we can, could write ourselves to a SIP protected location. We could, for example, overwrite the malware removal tool and then we, we would be launched uh, when the application, when the next starts 
um, and it would be quite difficult for Apple to remove us. Or basically, Apple could remove us, but any uh, fire scanners or something like that would not be able to remove us. And then finally, we could also load a kernel extension without approval by the user. So normally, when you uh, install a new kernel extension, you get this prompt, and the user really needs to click a couple of times to approve a new kernel extension. But we can just write to the database of approved kernel extensions, um, and then we would be automatically be loaded. Now, we still need to have a validly signed kernel extension, um, and kernel extension signing certificates are pretty hard to get. Uh, Apple is deprecating it, so it's uh, not really easy to get one. Um, but we might be able to find a vulnerable kernel extension, just any kernel extension at all with a vulnerability, and we could load that and exploit it, and then we would have full kernel code execution. But even without that, we would already have access to all SIP protected files. So even this, uh, up to this point, would already basically have fully compromised all of the sy sensitive sy information on the system. Now, I have this video to demonstrate this attack. Uh, this is on macOS 12.3, I think, so the sandbox escape still works. And first, to demonstrate that the uh, application really is sandboxed. So it goes through the three different steps here. This one was quite fast. Privilege escalation is a little bit slower because it needs to mount that disk image and then perform the installation. Through the pile, you see it on the desktop there. Might be able to make it a little bit more subtle, but didn't bother with that. And then now the SIP bypass should now spawn a shell. As you can see, it's a root shell. But also to demonstrate that we have also bypassed the SIP file system restrictions, we go to the system policy configuration directory, which is where the approved kernel extensions are stored, so a very uh, sensitive directory. And as you can see, we can create a new file here. So how was this fixed? Um, so with that new method I showed at start, Apple uh, third-party developers can indicate that their application only supports secure objects, uh, secure uh, deserialization for their saved state. Um, Apple has already enabled this for all of their own applications. And existing applications might want to store custom objects in their state. So that's why this delicate method was needed, because then that object would break if Apple enables this for all applications. Um, I'm not completely clear if it's still exploitable if the uh, application doesn't try to use that feature. Um, I haven't completely uh, tested that with the release. Uh, this was reported to Apple on de December 4th in 2020. And then they fixed the sandbox escape quite early um, in 11.3 in April. And then they introduced the fix together with the release of macOS Monterey. Now, I thought up to a week ago that they didn't backport this fix to Big Sur and Catalina because it was not originally in the release notes uh, or in the security advisories of Apple. But then last week, while I was composing my slides, I noticed that they added it to the Catalina release notes in May. So the Catalina release from October, they updated it in May to include this. I had missed that. Um, but in the Big Sur release notes have not been updated, so it's not listed there. But last week, uh, I got a spontaneous email from Apple that, uh, congratulations on your Black Hat talk. Uh, would, you be able, would you like to tell us what you're going to talk about? We might be able to provide feedback. So I asked, well, did you fix it in these other releases? And then just uh, two hours ago or something like that, they uh, told me that it should be fixed in Big Sur. That was not enough time for me to verify this, so <laughs> I don't know. Supposedly, it, it is fixed in both uh, older versions. So to conclude, um, macOS has security boundaries between processes, and these are very important for the security of the system. And these process injection vulnerabilities can now be used to break those boundaries. Um, the CVE 2021-3873 8.7.3 was a process injection vulnerability affecting basically all applications using AppKit. And we used this vulnerability to escape the sandbox, elevate privileges to root, 
um, and then bypassing the SIP file system restrictions. And it's fixed in October 2021. Now, some key takeaways here. Now, the macro security keeps adding more and more security layers, more and more to defend against attacks uh, by malware. But adding those new layers to an established system is quite hard because there's the, all of these parts that have been written before these new security requirements. And it's really hard to investigate the entire system anytime, anytime you make a change like this. So this code that was written before there was any attack service here is now suddenly attack service because you can attack other applications. And also an important point here, I think, is that the effort of attackers may not increase if you add more layers, if you can just use the same bug to bypass all of those layers. Or you might be able to find a trick to skip certain layers. Finally, here's some references for yeah, all the stuff that I used for this talk. Um, Apple's documentation and uh, the write-up from uh, Elias Morat, for example. Now, if you want to read more about this, uh, we will publish a write-up of this vulnerability with a lot more technical details sometime in the next couple of days. But if you have any questions now, then uh, please let me know.